Council Member Tom Merrill. Here. Thank you. Mayor John Neary. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Labor Representative Lance Norton. Here. Thank you. Council Member Sid Roberts. Here. Thank you. Council Member Jan Schwedy. Here. Thank you. Mayor Nicholas Smith. Here. Thank you. Council Member Stephanie Wright. Here. Thank you. And just one final check. Did we have Council Member Mead join? Okay, thank you. And I see alternate Mike Gallagher on the uh, has joined the meeting. So Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you. All right. Uh, public comment. We had one written public comment uh, that was sent to the board from uh, Mr. Kunzworth. So everybody got that. If you didn't, please let us know and we'll get back to you. Uh, we have nobody in the meeting room with us right now uh, to do public comment. I am going to ask if there's anybody on a Zoom call that wants to have public comment. Nobody has signed up in advance. Anybody there that wants to have public comment? Okay, going once, going twice, going ahead with our meeting. We have one person holding their hand up. Oh, there is. Who is that? Who? Joel Kunzler, sir. Joel Kunzler. Okay. Go. Go ahead. Wow, history in the making. A lot of people said it couldn't be done. But here we are, meetings being recorded, remote meetings from home and in person. Everything House Bill 1329 said, said it was possible. We're doing it right now. We're doing it live. I, I want to thank all the staff who pulled this off. There's more than one, and I only know the name of one, and I don't feel it's proper or appropriate for me to single out the one individual I know. That's just not what we're about up here in the North. Um, but, uh, you know, I just really am grateful for this. Um, I hope you all took my email to heart about the need to commit to merging with Everett Transit. Uh, you may know it's my new Zoom backdrop. That's on purpose. Showing Everett Transit community transit together. That's to send a powerful message that uh, we need both these networks working together. We need to cover pain field, all pain field. We need to, um, but especially the future of flight, we need to learn from ever transit how they've gotten zero emission buses going and we need you know there's you know we need to provide the tech support the community transit has provided so well with these meetings to for instance and and for riders attempting to navigate all the routes and systems with ever transit that doesn't have the capacity for that uh, i'm not asking for the kim what's the name of your ship board member doctor what's the name of your ship sir I'm not asking for the USS Enterprise to be built in the uh, in in the uh, shipyards, but I, I am asking that we really try to build a high tech system that's zero emission. I know CEO Ellen Fritz is really committed to, uh, to to that to that, and I just really think today is a very good day uh, for transit advocates and for those who believe in in open government. Um, uh, one last thing, kind of the loop back. You may know us. I may have to drop out of the meeting early. I'm so grateful for the meeting recordings as well. I've been provided. I hope long-term community transit will post those online. Uh, I don't like the responsibility of having to put them on YouTube, but that's what I'm doing right now for everybody. Why transit advocates appreciate the work all the staff is doing. And uh, I just want to extend my gratitude to everybody and every one uh, on the on today's accomplishment. And, and again, I want to stress, you know, the need to get ever transit merger community transit. I'm, and with that, I will uh, wrap up my comments by taking a quick screenshot of today's good news. Thank you, everyone. Anybody else that has, wants to raise their hand and speak to the board? Hang on, then we'll move on. Next are some presentations. Uh, the draft 2021 to 2026 Transit Development Plan, 
Yeah, just uh, real briefly, I wanted to uh, introduce this as one of our uh, important annual planning processes. I think the board is familiar with the transit development plan every year. Um, important one this year as we uh, as we look forward to connection to light rail and our 2024 network and also beginning to think about the the update to the long range plan and other major initiatives and so I wanted to introduce um, Sabina Araya who's our long range planning manager and Sabina has been managing this project uh, with uh, Thomas Tamola and his staff for uh, for a number of weeks and have done some great work and so we're here to introduce the board to the plan today thanks Sabina thank you Roland um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm here to introduce you this year's transit development plan update. This presentation and the memo you received in your packet will provide some of the highlights of the draft plan. And um, if we advance to the next slide, um, many of you are familiar with our process. The transit development plan is a six year plan required by Washington State. It is updated annually and submitted to WashDOT. And uh, the 2021 TDP summarizes activities and accomplishments from 2020, outlining um, agency goals and strategies for the next five years, including the one we're in. Uh, so 2021 through 2026 is the planning horizon. And it provides a financial forecast for these years implements our long range planning efforts and informs our budget process. And um, we incorporate financial updates, um, our business planning and service assumptions into the plan. We bring the draft plan to you um, for your review and for public review. We then incorporate edits into a final draft and we'll bring that back to you in September for adoption and then submission. Next. Our 2021-2026 priorities. Uh, first and foremost, we continue to ensure a safe and healthy environment for our customers. We also want to bring them back and bring back new customers and making them uh, feel comfortable returning to our services. In that regard, we want to understand um, our customers' uh, new commuting needs, provide equitable access to our transit services, and expand our public engagement and customer research programs. Um, connections to link light rail continues to be, of course, um, on the very short term horizon, first at Northgate in 2021, and then uh, in 2024 at Linwood uh, with Mount Lake Terrace and Shoreline also as important um, transfer uh, points. Um, in that regard, we are focusing a lot of our efforts on the 2024 planning, um, expanding and restructuring our service and continue to um, build our SWIFT network built, uh, build out. Um, we continue to innovate at the same time with the development of new and alternative services um, and options. On the capital side and supporting our service planning efforts, we are completing, uh, planning to complete our base expansion and renovation projects, our facility master plan. We are investing in our operating and capital reserves. We are also investing in supporting technology and improving service quality. And we are also committed to environmental stewardship and innovation by exploring the feasibility of future integration of zero emission vehicles that Joe just mentioned and uh, the associated infrastructure with that. We will also begin the next phase of long-term um, planning. Um, our long range plan was adopted in 2011 and had a 2030 horizon year. We want to align that with vision 2050 and um, up start the process of updating our long range plan. Next. In terms of our financial status, we were already in a strong position before the pandemic and um, our, um, during the pandemic, we did not experience a significant decline in sales tax revenue. The 2020 actual collections were at 154 million, um, exceeding last year's forecast. So we were preparing for um, for the worst case scenario and um, 
we exceeded that. The 2021 budget was initially set uh, conservatively at 122 million. It was then amended to 139 million, which you see on this graph. And um, current projections for 2021 um, are growing to 164 million. So we are in, in uh, really good financial standing from that perspective. In addition to our sales tax revenue, uh, we are looking at uh, the federal stimulus funds available to us. Uh, there are approximately $130 million, which provide us for um, an incredible opportunity to offset some of the operating costs and invest in uh, programs and uh, projects that we wouldn't um, have had the resources otherwise. Um, next slide. The theme for the next six years and beyond in what we do is expansion and innovation. Uh, as I mentioned, the federal stimulus funds are providing us an opportunity to free up some capacity and invest in uh, four main areas. Um, those are our capital prog uh, program. Uh, our capital projects include facilities, technology, vehicles, um, strengthening and um, refining our financial reserves. We we'll want to expand and improve our service and um, at the same time uh, in, invest in innovation. And that includes um, a variety of, of things, but it includes um, innovative service modes, improving our customers' experience in terms of how they use our technological platforms continuing to invest in our research program and improving the quality of our service uh, through things like uh, speed and reliability improvements. Next. So we'll, we'll look at each of those areas and I'll give you some highlights and what those would entail. Our capital program investments um, over the next few years include our facility master plan phases one through six. Um, so we've allocated additional funds to, um, to that program. Our SWIFT network, our orange and blue, uh, our orange line and our blue line expansion are coming on board in 2024. And you see that in this draft plan. The gold line is coming into the picture at the end of this planning horizon in 2026. And uh, you'll also see that in this draft plan. Uh, we're investing in fleet replacement, keeping an eye out on uh, what the availability of funds um, percentage-wise might be in the future and adjusting our uh, reserves ac accordingly. We're also investing in um, zero emission vehicles and infrastructure, uh, our bus stop program, and service quality, innovation, and sustainability programs. So we are um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those three areas as we're looking at reserves and how we're allocating funds in this draft plan uh, to address all of those areas. Next. Our financial reserves, um, community transit res uh, maintains reserves in multiple funds. These are designed for operations, vehicle replacement, facility preservation, and expansion projects. Um, funds are also maintained for workers' compensation claims and debt service payments. The Facility and Technology Expansion Fund represents funds designated for specific projects associated with expanded services and technologies. And um, these are some of the highlights of the increases um, that we were able to uh, update or put back or add this year. Um, and they're different than um, we had them last year where we were uh, very frugal. Um, the top portion of this slide uh, represents the increases and additions to the funds that we maintain. So as these funds are um, spent, they are being replenished to maintain that reserve. The bottom portion of the slide shows uh, one-time infrastructure set aside. So um, the three items that I had mentioned in the previous slide, the bus stop program, the zero emission vehicle and infrastructure program, um, and improvements in service quality, innovation and sustainability, they all have um, funds set aside, allocated 
dedicated that may um, not be spent right away, but we're putting them aside and um, allocating them to those programs um, in, this, in this fashion. So they are not replenishable, but um, they'll be saved. Um, in terms of service improvement strategy, um, as we've talked about in multiple times, a significant milestone in our growth over the next uh, six years is aligning and connecting bus service with Linwood Light Rail in 2024. And this is a major effort that includes the development of a new 2024 fixed route network that provides both connection but it expands options for um, Snohomish County residents. Um, it adjusts to service um, to change in markets and ensures that um, we keep in mind equitable access to our customers. Um, some strategies include uh, looking at performing, uh, underperforming routes, uh, reallocating resources, um, looking at restructuring the existing commuter service, which is um, the biggest um, the biggest trade-off that we have and um, that will increase our efficiency in a significant way. And we are uh, looking at recommendations of options for service innovations programs. Our Vanpool program uh, maintains its flexibility as, uh, as did our ridership on our fixed route uh, Vanpool uh, usage has declined during the pandemic, and we are uh, we want to be uh, maintaining that flexibility and be set for uh, an increase in ridership again. Next, going hand in hand with the previous slide, in terms of uh, fixed route service growth that this plan outlines, we are looking at approximately uh, thirty percent uh, through twenty twenty six. So it is significant. Uh, we are looking at September 2020 as our baseline, um, and an, an increase of 140,000 hours um, through 2026 um, in our network. Of course, those major milestones that I mentioned earlier are defining um, what our network structure should be and ensuring uh, our residents have access to those regional connections. Next. Innovation, service performance and quality and sustainability are all areas uh, that make things easier for our customers, uh, that improve our services, that um, ensure that customers are well taken care of, they get to where they need to go in a, in a reliable fashion. Um, those areas include our service. Um, I mentioned earlier about the development of innovative strategies for service options. We currently are working with the city of Linwood on our first pilot project. The goal for this pilot is to test a new mobility option that will complement existing transit services in early 2022 and uh, learn lessons, apply and improve those types of services and in the future. Our digital strategy refers to um, how our customers interact uh, with us online, either through our website, search engines, our email texting messages, and social media. So that is a very important point of communication with our customers. Improving speed and reliability has to do with our service quality, and uh, we plan to make investments in infrastructure, technology, and innovation that will uh, produce that improvement in, in service quality. And um, our research program, it will be a major focus over the next three years as we assess the, the engaging and engage our customers in how they now navigate the system, how they come back, what are their needs um, and schedules. We want to reach out to them and engage them in our um, planning efforts. Um, both 2024 and long range plan and the development of new services. And um, those, those efforts usually include a wide variety of uh, strategies like um, random selection surveys and um, focus groups, statistical analysis, et cetera. Next slide. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of commuter service uh, restructure, that is the mobility dividend um, that we get with light rail connection. It's an opportunity to um, engage um, the public into how to best utilize those resources that we're, we're getting back and providing even more service within our county. Um, in planning for a future, uh, of course, our, our one-time federal stimulus funding is um, projecting some of the projects forward and um, helping us um, develop better and uh, improve our service quality. We want to be mindful of post-COVID travel changes and look for opportunities for service quality, innovation, and sustainability improvements. Our long-range plan update, as I mentioned earlier, it'll be a process that will take us through the first quarter of 2023. So you'll see and hear a lot more about it um, in the next couple of years. It has a 2050 horizon year, and uh, that is the, the document that establishes the direction for, for the agency and uh, in terms of policy and priorities aligning with regional guidance. In this update, we also want to address climate change, zero emission, um, equity and inclusion, and expansion of mobility options um, that were not in our previous plan. Next. Um, in conclusion, or as highlights, in the next six years, uh, this draft plan shows we are remaining customer and community focused. We're safety oriented, financially strong. Um, we continue to innovate and be sustainable. What we're working on is expanding and restructuring our service, connecting to light rail, improving service performance and quality, and reducing our environmental impact. Next. And for this uh, draft plan, this is um, our schedule. Um, we are here to inform you of the draft plan, answer questions, and invite the public to comment on this draft plan over the next month. Um, on August 5th, we would like to have a public hearing and invite more comments um, to the board. And we'll come back on September 2nd uh, for um, a request for you to uh, approve the plan so that we can submit it. And, um, that, that concludes my presentation. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, I had a quick uh, question. Sabina, thank you for the presentation. I see on page uh, 54 um, the uh, order uh, uh, replacement uh, kind of way we're looking for the future. And I see in, in uh, 2024, we're scheduled to order 23 of the double talls. I'm just wondering with COVID and with, with uh, uh, Linwood Link and that, uh, are, are those, are we getting the bang for the buck out of those double talls? Is that still something that's really important to the fleet? I think um, to answer that, we have it in our plan, but we are not, um, we have not ordered them. I think we right. are still right, evaluating right, right. our fleet needs. Um, part of the work for the 2024 network is um, understanding how um, our fleet changes and how many vehicles we need. Um, you'll see in, in some of the service hours that are allocated, our total fleet requirement is still TBD. So we do plan to um, have 2024 assumptions finalized by next year, and that will give us a better idea of what our needs are. And you're right, that double, uh, double tall um, in, in our fleet, it is on the, on, in our transportation asset management plan as a replacement, but the type of vehicle that we are replacing it with or whether we need them um, as part of our future, that is, is, is not definitive. We're not, uh, and I'll let Roland maybe if, if there's if there's anything so, to add to that. So, so there's some shift on the fly here that, that could happen in terms of whether it's double talls or 60s or whatever. As, as we sort of look at how things are changing with light rail and that. So, okay, yeah. thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, anybody else have any questions? Okay, thank you.
different room, there's some people here. I guess. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sabina. That was a very good uh, presentation. I appreciate it. I look forward to hearing some more on this. I need to continue reading it. It's going to be a late night reading, I think. Uh, moving on, Roland, you're on again. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, Roland Behe, Director of Planning and Development. Um, I'm going to be uh, pinch hitting today for my research and, and uh, analytics team. So um, I just wanted to, to thank uh, the team for uh, pulling all the data together for our ridership reporting. And uh, they're responsible for the, the work that I'll be sharing with you. So thank you. Uh, so I'll be reviewing uh, briefly the 2021 quarter one ridership report. Uh, this is ridership for January, February, and March. We'll also be giving in the presentation um, a number of uh, uh, slides that give a preview of trends so far through quarter two, and then also be taking a look forward um, toward what we project for year end, uh, and finally uh, doing some regional comparisons with um, how community transit looks uh, regarding uh, comparisons to our partners. Next slide, please. So this is a familiar format, I think, for the board as we've been bringing these reports uh, forward uh, with some regularity. The, uh, the three bars on the left uh, show a comparison between ridership uh, as it came in uh, across the, uh, the four different modes. So uh, regular fixed route bus, our swift bus rapid transit, the van pool system, and then, uh, and then our DART paratransit. And uh, 2019 was really the last, what I would call normal year, uh, full year of pre-pandemic ridership. And then we can see a 6% um, uh, reduction in the January through March boardings in 2020, as we just started to get into the uh, the early weeks of the pandemic. So most of that first quarter last year was was business as usual, although we did have a snowstorm thrown in there, which we'll see a little bit of the impact of that later. And then uh, in the in the third bar there in 2021, you can really see that full uh, impact of the uh, of the pandemic as as we look at the first three months of this year. Uh, it's a um, I think a, a story that we have been repeating and the, the board is familiar with in terms of the overall uh, level of impact. Uh, and um, you know, you can see one, one thing I will note and I'll, we'll see it more clearly when we look at the fixed route slides is a, a dramatic impact on, uh, on um, bus services uh, in general and especially on, uh, on the commuter based services. And you can see that with the impact on Vanpool, uh, lower level of impact on, on BRT service. Uh, next slide, please. And next, as we go into looking at the individual modes, um, in terms of fixed route boarding, so here we're looking at the, uh, at the fixed route uh, bus system. Uh, you can see, uh, again, that story where uh, in 2019, um, we had uh, overall uh, 10 million boardings for the year, and you can see how that was distributed across the, uh, the, the different quarters. And then in 2020, this dramatic reduction um, in, in ridership as the pandemic took hold. And so far in 2021, you can see that bottom bar there in the darkest blue color shows uh, that uh, in 2021, we're about 53% lower than we were for the same quarter last year. And again, that is because last year, um, most of that quarter was, was really pre-pandemic condition. And what I'll note on the slide is the um, not only the, the ridership numbers, we, uh, we took in um, just over a million riders in the first quarter, but also the productivity numbers. Uh, just a reminder that when we say productivity, we're talking about the number of riders per hour of service that we operate. And you can see that we were trending just about 23 boardings per hour of service operated before the pandemic on the bus system. Um, and we're running uh, uh, right around 14.7 uh, last year. And again, that's, that's being buoyed up by the fact that we had uh, a, a little more than two months in first quarter, it was still, still helping to, uh, to raise that statistic with some of the pre-pandemic levels of ridership. And now in 2021, we're really seeing the full impact of that uh, from a productivity perspective with about 11 and a half boardings per hour of service. I would just also note that that um, also corresponds with the increased distancing requirements um, that, uh, that uh, through this first uh, 15, 16 months of the pandemic that we have had on our vehicles. So um, uh, fewer people per, per hour of service carried, both from a demand perspective and also um, had, that we have been enforcing that distancing on the buses. Next slide, please. 
This begins to show how that uh, demand plays out over the different days of the week. And I'll uh, just call attention to the table on the right-hand side showing um, in the top row our weekday ridership pre-pandemic, uh, more than 30,000 boardings per day. And then if we look at the 2021 number in the far right column there, right now on the bus system, uh, averaging about 13,000 uh, boardings per weekday. And the one thing I'll also point out on this slide, and we'll see it uh, as a trend throughout the um, uh, the rest of the presentation as well. We've had major impacts on weekday in terms of impact on ridership, lower levels of impact on Saturday and Sunday. And that reflects that in general, the local bus system, which provides for a wider diversity of trips, it's not so commuter focused, has tended to fare better. It's been more resilient with a wider range of trip purposes and a lot more uh, general travel happening on the system. And you can see both in the bar charts here and in the statistics in the table, that um, we are down on Saturday and Sunday, but not nearly to the degree that we are down on weekdays. Um, those bars are much closer uh, to the, uh, the pre-pandemic condition um, than they are in the weekday numbers. Next slide. So this chart is, uh, is where we start to give um, a little bit of a preview looking ahead beyond first quarter, and it brings us almost up to the current date. Uh, what we're looking at here is a, overall an eight-year trend going all the way back to 2014, showing the weekly, um, in, in seven-day increments, the weekly ridership trend over that period. And you can see uh, in the darker uh, uh, black line um, that, that extends through the full year, that is the trend for last year, 2020. And you can see that very steep drop off early in the year in the February, March timeframe as we very quickly shut the community down um, uh, and, uh, and, and people began to, um, to no longer move through the, through the community so freely and therefore transit demand really dropped. And then that trend continuing all the way through the year um, with, uh, with minor ups and downs, but generally remaining at that, at that very low level. The blue line coming in from the left-hand side of the chart uh, in the middle, you can see um, that trend has continued to be, to be low, very slight upward uh, trajectory on it. And, and we've seen that uh, particularly in, in some of the, um, the different subsets of our service. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, but generally still tracking pretty close to that um, to that pandemic low that we've seen um, for the the, the last uh, several quarters um, of ridership. The only other thing I'll point out on this chart is we did have two snowstorms that that impacted first quarter ridership in 2019 and 2020, and you can also see the impacts of those on the on the left hand side of the chart. Next slide. So this chart shows in negative numbers, the, uh, the, uh, the loss of ridership by type of service. And so, um, so the greater the, the, the depth of the bar extending to the left, the greater the impact on ridership. And right up at the top, no surprise, are Seattle commuter services um, off 85% uh, from that, um, uh, from that uh, first quarter of 2020, which again was largely a pre-pandemic condition. Uh, likewise, major impacts on our in-county or Boeing services and for the University of Washington services, all three of those being um, almost entirely focused on a peak directional commute, which is where the biggest impacts have been during this event. And then you can see in the local services, both feeder uh, in the more urbanized areas um, and the high frequency corridor services in the, in the urban areas, and then the more rural services, uh, lower levels of impact um, reflecting the, the greater diversity of trip purposes and, and the fact that a lot of essential travel is happening on those routes. And then finally, at the bottom, the most remarkable story here is, you know, the BRT service, SWIFT. Um, down, down 25%, but that really means retaining 75% of its pre-COVID ridership levels. It has really been carrying uh, more riders than anything else we operate um, and uh, has been quite resilient. Um, likewise, reflecting our understanding that BRT really provides for the widest variety of trips um, of any service that we operate. Next slide. So this shows some of the, the more recent trends in recovery by route group. And the chart reads with positive uh, bars moving to the right in blue and negative bars moving to the left in red. And uh, some different, uh, this is a percentage change. The actual magnitude of the numbers you can see uh, in the smaller type uh, is, is different depending on the type of service. Uh, the most significant story here I think I'll talk about is um, that top bar where we see a 29% um, return on 
the Seattle commuter services. And again, they were the most severely impacted. So that's 29% on what was a much reduced base, but it is an indicator that we are starting to see some increase in ridership on the services and the, the degree of reporting by our uh, both uh, direct operations and also our contracted services on how many times they have to um, utilize standby coaches because of loads exceeding what, what has been allowed on the buses. Um, those reports really indicate to us that this is real. There are um, a lot of people coming back to the commuter services as we see that traffic increase on I-5 and, and the jobs are coming back to downtown Seattle. Um, we are seeing, you can see some, some negative bars there in terms of uh, uh, a modest reduction around 6% in our BRT ridership from the um, from the peak that we saw uh, in uh, 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 last year during the pandemic, um, and, uh, and likewise a decrease on the in-county or the Boeing services. I would note that on the Boeing services, that's a change of 39 weekday, 39 weekly boarding. So it's just the magnitude of the number is quite small on that service. So it's uh, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't read too much into the magnitude of that bar. But uh, these are trends that we're monitoring um, and uh, you know, continuing to, um, to look for root, root causes in the changes. Next slide. So this is uh, looking at our van pool service. Uh, and again, as with the commuter services to downtown Seattle on the bus side, van pool likewise heavily influenced by change in the, in the commute market um, and uh, shift to a lot of telework. And so this, this is reflected in the numbers down 63% first quarter this year versus first quarter year before. Um, and you can see, uh, you know, that total of, uh, of just under 52,000 boardings for the period. So much different than, than we were pre-pandemic. Next slide. This shows again, the, the day by day, uh, how that statistic plays out in terms of weekday boarding, Saturday and Sunday. Van pool primarily a weekday service by nature. Um, and you can see those daily boarding numbers in the table on the right. Uh, Pre-pandemic, more than 3,000 per weekday, down to current condition in first quarter of this year, around just over 600 boardings per day. So, um, again, a, a dramatic reduction, um, and um, you know, will be largely dependent on the extent to which the um, the employment market comes back with uh, with in-office work. Next slide. So there's some complexity to the slide. I'm just going to walk through it um, uh, quadrant by quadrant. And uh, what I'll direct our attention to first is the upper left quadrant, where we're looking at the number of van pool groups that are actually operating. And you can see, similar to the ridership trends earlier, we're showing multiple years in, in one chart, the gray and, and black lines indicating previous years. And you can see that dark line for 2020 with that, again, the precipitous drop off in number of groups in the March timeframe. And then relatively consistent throughout the year last year. And what I'll note on those numbers, it talks about 245 van pool groups being currently active and, and about 262 at the end of last year. And that's comprised of a combination of the, the numbers you see on the chart, which are the um, 141 at the end of last year and 139 currently that are, um, that are on the road. And then the remainder of that, uh, so currently about 106 groups that are um, that uh, still retain their van and are ready to use it, but uh, but are essentially have it parked. And so they haven't wanted to turn the van back in because they are, uh, I think, very hopeful they'll be back in active service soon. Um, and uh, so we continue to support them in that. But again, um, these numbers won't change until we see a, a substantial change in the, in the commute activity. At the upper right quadrant of the chart, we see that uh, likewise, the number of riders per trip in vans has fallen substantially. Um, over this period, uh, just over three riders per trip uh, right now in 2021 first quarter. And then moving to the lower left quadrant of the graph, uh, similarly, the number of days operated uh, is also somewhat reduced looking at an average uh, or a current position right now of about 18, 18 days um, per month, which is, uh, which is lower than, um, than the pre-pandemic condition. And finally, customers per group in the lower right, again, tracking as with riders per trip, we're, we're looking at smaller groups um, than we have in the past. So all of this due to reduced demand. Next slide. Shifting focus to the DART system. Uh, 
little different story here. We, we um, saw some, uh, again, very precipitous drop off uh, initially, and you can see um, how those numbers played out by quarter last year. Um, overall, you know, DART was one of the most heavily impacted um, with, uh, you know, vulnerable populations sheltering in place and not uh, traveling out on the system. And so um, very few trips happening during particularly the early weeks and months of the pandemic. And then you can see the results overall for first quarter of this year, 57% lower than first quarter last year, again, which was largely a, a pre-pandemic condition. Next slide. And this is how that translates again, uh, looking at the, at the daily numbers, um, weekday, Saturday, Sunday, and looking at the table on the right-hand side, you can see that um, uh, during first quarter carried about 200 people per weekday, which was uh, about a third of what we had been carrying um, pre-pandemic. And uh, then you can see uh, 97 on Saturdays and 61 on Sundays. Next slide. This is where the story really starts to, um, uh, to change. We are seeing a, a much more substantial return uh, on DART in terms of trip making and particularly in, in the last, uh, in, in recent weeks and months. And I'll, um, if you recall earlier in the presentation, we showed the same chart for bus. And you may recall that the, the black line moving across the chart in that, in that much reduced ridership condition uh, continued into the blue line showing year to date for 2021. And there wasn't a lot of difference between the two. They really were ending up uh, very close to the same place when we bring it up to date in that uh, April, May, June timeframe. Uh, DART's a different story. We are seeing substantially more trips on the system still far below the pre-pandemic normal we would expect, but, um, but the, uh, our contractor is, is definitely seeing um, a, uh, a rapid return to that condition. And so we'll keep tracking this uh, you know, throughout the year, but uh, there's clearly um, a, lot more, a lot more travel going on right now uh, with those vulnerable populations and they're, they're finding their way back to the system. Next slide. And the next one, we're going to talk a bit about what are we seeing looking forward. Uh, this is uh, some of the information that we get uh, from our surveys. Uh, the board will, will likely recall that we have done now two what we're calling customer pulse surveys. We do one back in May of last year, and we did another one early this year in the February, March timeframe. And these were um, rapidly deployed check-ins with uh, with um, the community, we, we um, surveyed both customers, we surveyed uh, customers who were currently riding, customers who have stopped riding uh, for a variety of reasons, and also people who, um, who are not current customers, really to get a, a good cross-section of, um, of concerns, of attitudes um, regarding travel and, and transit and community transit. And what we learned uh, consistently in that, in that survey was there is a significant group of former riders that are currently staying away and they're staying away um, until their employer asks them to return to work. And um, we, we drilled into that and also asked about timing, about when they expect to return. And you can see the numbers on the right there where uh, we had um, about half of them uh, returning by July, uh, about three quarters returning by September and substantially more by the time we get to end of year. And so we have um, employed that data to help us forecast ridership uh, through the end of the year. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, please. This begins to project that forward. And so what we're looking at here is a combination of the survey data, which helps us uh, assign a factor to ridership uh, and how it may grow between now and the end of the year. We're also incorporating the ridership trends that we have seen in recent months, and also then looking back at pre-pandemic ridership trends on the different lines of service that we operate. And so it is a model. It is based on um, the best assumptions that we have, but they are assumptions. So you know we want to be clear that it's it is a forecast at this point. Uh, but we'll keep tracking this. And what the number on the on the left hand side shows, this is the one I'll focus on, is that we're uh, through first quarter we had um, experienced. 1.85 million boardings and um, and we are or excuse me that's the current year to date forecast and we are um, or, or uh, ridership number and we are forecasting six million boardings uh, by the end of this year and so that uh, that will happen based on the assumption of an acceleration of return uh, of ridership as the community opens up as um, you know as we have we, we return to full capacity on our vehicles and no longer restrict um, the number of boardings per trip, and uh, and as employers begin to call workers back, which um, you know which we are seeing 
not only here at Community Transit, but beginning to see throughout, um, you know, throughout Puget Sound. So all of that will, you know, will help to drive this return. Um, like I said, it is a model. We will be refining this um, with another pulse survey that we will deploy in the uh, in the third quarter of this year, and uh, that will help us to refine the forecast and continue tracking this into the fall. Next slide. So I'm going to run through quickly some regional comparisons and then we'll wrap up the presentation. So if we could go to the next one. This shows uh, how community transits experience uh, in January through March, the first quarter of 21 compared um, to other uh, peer transit agencies and you know neighboring agencies throughout the state of Washington. And these are based on national transit database numbers that uh, um, that we're able to uh, to pull for direct comparison. And again, what we're looking at is the comparison of uh, first quarter of this year to first quarter of last year. And the takeaway is everybody has been impacted. And what you see at the top of the chart with Sound Transit is agencies that tend to have a, a greater focus on, um, on the work commute were, were much more heavily impacted. Community Transit is a bit of a hybrid because we have a, a commute focus and we also have a lot of local service. And so we tend to be kind of in the middle of that equation. But you can see, uh, you know, consistently big numbers across the state and, and we're kind of in the middle of the pack there at a 53% reduction. Next slide. Similar story for Vanpool. Um, again, the, the agencies that have Vanpool programs and you can see uh, community transit, um, you know, relatively middle of the pack there at a 63% loss uh, compared to uh, first quarter of prior year. And uh, I'll just note, you know, Yakima, kind of the outlier out there at 90%, but, uh, but that's based on a one van program. So um, just be sure the, you know, the numbers are important here in terms of uh, um, magnitude of impact. Next slide, please. And this is uh, reflecting a little of that story I told earlier. DART, uh, you know, right now, community transit showing a 57% reduction uh, as opposed to uh, first quarter of 2020. The last time we shared this slide with the board in our previous report, we were the, we had had the greatest impact in the state. And so, you know, Minor incremental change. Now, you know, we're showing a, a little bit uh, better performance than than what uh, than what Everett and Ctran are showing, but still, you know, still a heavy impact to us um, based on the uh, you know the level of ridership loss that we saw um, through the pandemic. So, so positive trend, but but still um, a long ways to go. Next slide. That is the end. Uh, I guess just you know, final points that I'll make is our, our ridership remains um, far below normal. Um, and this is uh, you know, particularly uh, focused in the commute-based services that are dependent on employment. So our commuter bus and van programs, uh, relatively higher performance or, or lower levels of ridership loss on our uh, SWIFT BRT and local services. We are seeing some, some early uh, promising recovery on the DART system. And as I said, we'll continue to monitor this both with our statistics coming in through the bus system and also with our customer surveys. And uh, we are projecting stronger growth for the remainder of the year as the community opens. And with that, I'll hand it back to the chair and would be happy to take any questions. Do you have any questions for Roman on the leadership report? Hot outside. Everybody should be good. <laughs> you can answer someone I have. Oh, answer that. Okay. Thank you, Roland. Appreciate that. Uh, seeing no questions, we'll go ahead and move on to the rest of the meeting. Uh, Chief Executive Officer's report. <clears throat> Three minutes. You've got three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a lot going on in there. Thank you. Uh, before I jump into it, I just want to thank uh, Sabina and Roland for their presentations and applying for. Uh, of there that July comment period for the TDP was an opportunity for folks to let us know how they're feeling about the direction we're heading. And, and this document is really starting for the first time to sort of telegraph where we're headed as we sit at the board. Sure. Imagining our network around it's the beginning of that conversation. Uh, you can't hear me? We're taking that. <laughs> <laughs> We're calling.
try to pursue that for a while. I'll bring my coach voice to the presentation. Um, on the ridership report, um, thank you, Roland, for that. I, I think uh, he's right. We're going to be monitoring this very closely. There's some events out there that we'll be watching. Uh, today is day one of the governor having lifted all the building restrictions. And so we're going to be looking closely to see what kind of response uh, the employment computer market has to that development. Looking ahead to the fall, the return to school, uh, the opening of uh, Northgate, uh, excuse me, Northgate Link in, in October 2nd, the reopening of the University of Washington. These are all major events out there that we'll be watching to see how the, how the ridership demand uh, responds. And so the forecast that we gave you is an optimistic one. It, it's looking at what happens if the survey results we've gotten play out uh, as reflected. It's going to be an interesting summer. Um, so let me jump in uh, a couple of operational things to highlight. Um, as I said, June 30 marks the sunset date for the COVID restrictions we've been working with. The most significant implication of that uh, for us is that we will be lifting uh, the social distancing requirements on board our coaches. I sent out to the board uh, just the other day a regional press release explaining how the regional transit agencies and the, and the industry uh, coordinating that change. So that's big news, and uh, will give us the ability to accommodate demand uh, as it comes back. Uh, we will continue to maintain six-foot distancing around coach operators uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, but that's, that's a big event. So we've responded to that by removing the uh, taping and the signage on board the coaches and, and bringing in new signage, uh, maintaining distance from the coach operators, uh, and also Reminding folks that even though we're making these changes, the uh, federal mask mandate remains in place uh, for passengers and employees on board vehicles and passenger facilities. Um, so we'll see what happens as that goes forward. Uh, I know Roland and Steve and our contracted service operators are relieved. We're starting to see ridership on the service level for that six foot requirement. Uh, we had an extreme heat event the last few days. It seems like everybody was talking about it. And uh, here at Community Transit, we planned for that event the way we would for a snow event, uh, looking at what uh, precautionary measures and preparations we should make to make sure we could navigate that uh, safely. Uh, we provided extra water for our coach operators and employees in the field, cooling opportunities for employees here on base. Uh, as I mentioned in my email to the board about this, all employees on the operational side of the So uh, we're relatively uh, fortunate to come through it uh, routinely. Uh, we had a, a couple of minor issues around the uh, computer service with the buckling of I 5 down in Seattle. Uh, we saw some minor pavement buckles here on base over the entrance to the, to the operating base. Uh, but nothing that uh, interfered with or hampered our operation. So we don't expect to see another event like that this summer, knock on wood, but we are already meeting and debriefing and trying to draw lessons from the event and what it tells us about resiliency going forward. Uh, this may not uh, be the last time to see an event like this. Um, on the employee front, uh, we are just about to 60% vaccination of all the workforce. Our incentive program is still in place. We're working steadily toward our 75% goal, which if we maintain our current pace, uh, we could reach a year off. So we'll continue to communicate with employees about that. We are returning employees to base uh, next week. Uh, July 6th, yeah. uh, so we have developed a phased transition plan to bring employees back, um, and each department has worked through their directors and managers to make sure that we're providing enough flexibility uh, to safely and efficiently bring folks back while maintaining continuity of operations. So that's another big development. Uh, we are clarifying our existing telework policy with new procedures. Uh, to equip managers with the ability to work with employees, to authorize telework where appropriate, uh, where it balances effectively uh, with the needs of the organization and the needs of the employee. Uh, 
Uh, we don't think that's going to re require a policy change by the board. It's more of a procedural update. I've been talking to a lot of our peer agencies, uh, other employers through SKIT and EA EASC, and it's a common conversation going on amongst employers about the need to have more flexibility to recruit and retain employees uh, in the in the in the 21st century economy. So we'll we'll take advantage of that. Um, we have just rolled out a new safe driving policy, and uh, that is effective today as well. Life first for our coach operators. Uh, we had not revisited our prior accident policy or safe driving policy since 2006. So it's been over 15 years since that policy had been updated. Uh, and clearly much has changed in the operating environment uh, over that time. We had a very collaborative, collaborative effort uh, with our representatives of organized labor and our coach operators. And it seems at this point that the new policy has been well received. Uh, and positive, so we'll be monitoring its implementation as we go forward. Uh, we've kicked off the 2022 budget process, so departments are in the midst of preparing for the board's consideration. Um, the proposed 2022 budget, um, our focus is going to be to bring our service back up to pre-pandemic levels, to re-engage with our customers and invite them back to the system. Uh, and while we do that, to understand how demand for transit is evolving in the post-pandemic world. Uh, we don't expect things to return to normal as they were in 2019. Uh, we think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges for us is to really understand how the demand for transit evolves and how we can best serve it. And that begins with understanding the needs of our customers. While we do that, uh, we're going to shift our focus. As Sabina presented uh, in the draft TDP, light rail is coming to Linwood in 2024. And the opportunity that presents us is to look at how we might reinvest the 30% of our service we operate today into Seattle. And what that means is a potential mo mobility dividend for the people of Snohomish County. So that's a big change. Um, and it's a big opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to get better at what we do to provide better service for our customers. So you'll see those seeds planted in the 2022 budget as well. Uh, we'll be looking at innovation. Uh, again, you heard that from Sabina, looking at our zero emission study, looking to update our long range plan, uh, looking to improve our customers' ability to interact with us digitally. Um, those are the themes that you'll see in the 2022 budget, in the TDP, and as we move into next year, looking at our long-range plan update. And we will propose to undertake those, change, those changes and manage those changes against the backdrop, of course, of long-term financial stability and health. Um, shifting gears externally, um, there's been a lot of activity there as well. Uh, I just finished a round of outreach to our aviation partner. Uh, met with Arif Gauch, uh, the airport director, uh, Brett Smith, the propeller, uh, and Terry Ryan from Snohomish County uh, to talk about how we can partner together uh, between modes. And that was interesting, and I got a chance to tour the new terminal. It was a little quiet, I will admit. Uh, they're struggling with some of the same issues we are as a transportation provider. Uh, I spent a day with Mayor Nearing. Uh, up in Arlington, excuse me, Marysville. I just looked at Jan and said Arlington, uh, but I want to thank uh, right the mayor is. again <laughs> uh, for his time and the time of his staff to show us around and, and show us what's cooking in, in, in Marysville. And it was great because I had had a chance to visit Arlington the month prior, and now I've seen sort of both halves of the Cascade Industrial Center. The amount of activity up there still is just astonishing. So thank you for that. Um, we sponsored, uh, and I got a chance to speak briefly at the uh, Shoreline Chamber of Commerce State of the City event, uh, and that was interesting. Obviously, Shoreline is across the line in King County, uh, but uh, it's important because we are proposing to expand and extend the Blue Line uh, from the Aurora Village Transit Center down to that Shoreline light rail station. So we're collaborating with the city, uh, working on um, figuring out how that project is going to be implemented. 
and what it means for not only the people of now South Snohomish County is providing access to the light rail system at, at Shoreline, but also uh, our partners in Shoreline. Uh, we had a staff presentation at the Linwood Chamber about the pilot project, and we've gotten very positive engagement on that. We've had over 1,200 uh, surveys returned from Linwood residents and businesses uh, providing input for, to help us shape that, that pilot project so that continues forward and uh, working collaboratively between uh, our staff and the city staff. Shifting gears quickly to the legislative report. Again, uh, reported to you earlier that we've gotten news of another grant from the federal government of $6.5 million for the Orange Line. That's great news, and that uh, essentially contributes toward the local match for the Orange Line uh, Small Start Grant of $37 million. So we're now at $43.5 million in federal investment in the Orange Line project, which is great news, and we are moving forward with dispatch on that. Um, we've just begun staff-level discussions at PSRC around the allocation of the ARPA funding, and uh, Board Chair Daughtry and, and Board Member Schwetti will be uh, working on that through their positions on the Transportation Policy Board. So more to come on that, but that process is just getting started. There's a ton of collaboration going on between community transit staff and sound transit staff over the uh, October 2nd opening of the Northgate uh, Link project. Uh, you may recall that in April, we dedicated a Saturday to running a simulated bus uh, rail integration uh, test at the Northgate station where we and King County Metro and Sound Transit uh, came together and ran buses through the station to simulate uh, peak hour uh, drop off and pick up uh, uh, to integrate with light rail operations. And we learned a lot. We came out of that test with a long list of items to work on, issues to address, and Sound Transit has been terrific in working with us. Uh, to, to resolve issues and make sure we're in the best possible position to deliver a positive customer experience. Uh, the most notable issue there is uh, uh, the addition of a fifth bay. Uh, fifth, there's four bus bays in the current station configuration. Uh, they've agreed to add a fifth to provide more capacity for that peak hour uh, passenger uh, loading and, and, and drop off activity. So we're real grateful to Sound Transit, also to the Seattle Department of Transportation that's working to uh, uh, inform that design and permit those activities. Um, Everett Transit, uh, as you may have read, uh, City of Everett staff reported back to the council on June 9th, the results of its public outreach within the City of Everett on the possible future uh, alternatives for Everett Transit, and uh, the staff received some direction from the council to reach out to us to have some conversations uh, about what a process might look like to discuss consolidation of our organizations. Um, so we have uh, had an initial outreach from the city staff. We've had a couple of uh, preliminary conversations and uh, we agreed to sit down and work together to flesh out some ideas uh, and bring those back uh, for your consideration uh, at a later date. So nothing significant to report there yet. Uh, we're just beginning that process, uh, but we will keep you posted and uh, let you know how that goes initially. Um, we are beginning construction next week at the Merrill Creek operating base uh, to expand the base. It's very exciting. Uh, it seems propitious that we're coming out of uh, the pandemic restrictions right at the time. We just coincidentally happened to be uh, starting a major project to expand the capacity of the Merrill Creek base. And so we are having an event uh, on July 7th uh, and we'll have a number of uh, dignitaries and partners and elected officials there and uh, we would uh, love to have the board there as well. Chair Daughtry will be there to, to preside and welcome our guests. We'll also be uh, using that day to recognize our employees and thank them for the work they've done over the past year and a half, uh, maintaining service uh, through the pandemic and keeping each other and, and our customers safe. So it's gonna be a, an opportunity to uh, celebrate outdoors 
uh, appropriately uh, and uh, talk about what the future looks like as we uh, move forward with the growth of our system. Uh, let's see, a couple more things and then I'll wrap up. Um, I think in addition to the uh, Merrill Creek base, uh, Greg and uh, June and Roland have kept the SACD committee uh, well informed on the progress of our construction uh, at the Cash Park Administration Facility. Uh, we're getting close to 60% completion on that project, and so we are going to reach out and talk uh, and invite board members to come tour the facility uh, later this summer. We're making great progress. The project is trending uh, uh, on schedule and under budget. And uh, it, it'd be an opportunity to see how that's going, uh, what that new facility is going to look like. And as a reminder, we're undertaking that so that we can vacate this facility and make room uh, for the transportation facilities here to expand to accommodate that growth. So Rachel will reach out to you and you can expect to hear uh, from her about some options for dates uh, maybe in August. Um, I guess last but not least, I, I want to remark on the meeting today uh, in, in this hybrid uh, environment. Um, there's been a lot of firsts over the last year and a half, and uh, before I got here, obviously, you had your, your first pandemic board meeting by conference call, I think, in April. And 15 months later, here we are uh, having another first a hybrid meeting where we've got members attending from from abroad and citizens attending from outside the room and, and those of us here uh, meeting and doing business together uh, and it, it's just really remarkable we've accomplished a lot uh, over the year of 2020 and the first half of 2021 uh, we kept each other safe we kept our customers safe we didn't miss a day of service uh, over that period uh, we're coming out of this in solid financial condition, and uh, I just think it's remarkable notable that we're here together today for the first time in, in well over a year. So I want to thank the board for your patience and your leadership and your flexibility, because uh, it's been a long run. And uh, to be able to get back together in this room for the first time in my tenure, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. So, so thank you. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anybody have any questions for? Yeah, I have a I have a quick one, Kim. Um, I know that we are hiring uh, coach operators, but I was wondering if uh, with the other departments, did we have people who are still not coming in, or how many people did we lose during this? Uh, so we have had uh, most of our administrative employees working remotely. Okay. Um, I would have to ask for some help from Cesar in terms of turnover, um, and we can get certainly get back to you with that information, but I think we've been remarkably stable. Um, we are fully staffed at this point uh, to handle uh, the service change this fall on the transportation side. Uh, we are continuing to recruit coach operators on an ongoing basis. Uh, I know the transit industry in general is seeing some scarcity in that regard, um, but uh, community transit has always been a popular place to work, and, and uh, as of right now, we're pretty well positioned. Okay, um, I was I, I just know it's bad out there. There's so many places that don't have employees. But, yeah. Uh, and so I was just curious if you had any staff in any of these departments. Thank you. Well, knock on wood, we're <laughs> we're okay, but we'll it's it's a good thing to keep an eye on. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions for the CEO? Okay, then we'll move on uh, to committee reports. So I'll start with the executive committee report. Uh, executive committee met on Thursday, June 17th. Council Member Schley, Council Member Marine, Mayor Nearing, and I attended. The CEO provided his report at that meeting, uh, much of what we've discussed today already, what he discussed today already. We also discussed this hybrid format for our meeting today and what's going to be going on forward. We were briefed on the room capacity, the limits of technology uh, in this room, and we decided that the July 1st meeting today would be the first hybrid meeting, uh, and the plan is to continue with this format. 
Following public meeting best practices, the committee expressed support for live streaming board meetings to Community Transit YouTube page and providing a library of meeting video recordings online. The committee recommended these two elements start with the August board meeting. The next executive committee meeting is scheduled for July 15th at 11.30. My computer is asking me to unmute myself, but I'm not going to do that because we have a rolling <laughs> uh, next will be the Finance Performance and Oversight Committee from Council Member Schwede. Okay, can everybody hear me? I yeah. can't tell. Okay. Be loud. Okay, the Finance Performance and Oversight Committee met on Thursday, June 17, 2021 via Zoom. CEO Rick Elgentritz, agents, uh, agency staff and board members Tom Merrill, Sid Roberts, and I attended. On the consent agenda, approval of May 2021 expenditures and payroll, items D through I, or is that L? I'm sorry. I. Is it I? Okay. Sorry. Um, and then item two on the consent agenda is award RFQ 2021-045 for engine parts and filters for uh, our coaches. This contract is for replacement engine parts and filters on our coaches. The existing contract expired May 31, 2021. The cost is not to exceed $950,000 annually. The committee recommended approval. On the action agenda, amending section five of the personnel policy, Chris Beck will provide an overview on proposed amendments to section five of the personnel policy. The committee recommended approval. Uh, reports the May 2021 sales tax report. Community Transit collected approximately 15.8 million in sales tax, which was approximately 4.6 million more than budgeted. This is for purchases made in March. The May 2021 diesel fuel report year to date Community Transit paid an average of $1.98 per gallon for diesel fuel compared to 2021 amended budget amount of $2.07 per gallon. The next Finance Performance and Oversight Committee meeting is scheduled for 2 p.m. Thursday, July 15, 2021 via Zoom and Community Transit and Conference Room. And just as a note on uh, the fuel, it was over four dollars a gallon this morning. So what will happen to the diesel? But it's going up. Right transit. Okay, uh, strategic alignment, capital development committee, council member Marine. Thanks, chair. Uh, the strategic alignment and capital development committee was held remotely over Zoom on Wednesday, June 16th at 2 p.m. I was present, as was council member Tom Merrill, labor representative Lance Norton. Mayor Nicholas Smith and Councilmember Stephanie Wright. The committee reviewed and forwarded one item on today's consent agenda, and that is RFP 2021-032 of the diesel exhaust tanks expansion. This item is for the award of supply and installation of the new DEF equipment and removal of existing DEF equipment at the Cash Park Operating Base and Merrill Creek Operating Base. The contract is with Blue One Energy for a cost of $163,393. The committee heard two informational items presented to the board earlier in today's meeting. That was the draft 2021-2026 transit development plan and the 2021 first quarter ridership report. You'll remember hearing those at the beginning of the meeting. Yes, we sat through them twice, and I haven't committed to memory. <laughs> the next meeting of the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee is Wednesday, July 21st at 2 p.m. Chair? All right, thank you. All right, uh, on to the consent items. I would entertain a motion for the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded here in the office. Any discussions on the motion? Call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Pass unanimously. 
Next on the agenda is the action items. Adopt section five of the personnel policy manual as amended. Mr. Becker, Chris Beck. Mr. Chris Beck, sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, sorry about that if I interrupted you. I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. Okay, great. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Beck and I work in the employee engagement department here at Community Transit with Cesar Portillo, our director of employee engagement. I'm presenting today on changes to section five of the personnel policy manual. These recommended changes um, are only affecting our administrative employees that, that are non-represented employees. The pay plan and compensation policy was last updated in 1999. Normally, we would present policy changes to our CEO, um, but because of some of the best practice changes that we are recommending, um, because they could have governance, uh, policy governance issues, the board needs to approve these policies. In your packet, we included a list of all the changes um, and the draft section five with all the changes applied. Under the umbrella of best practices, we're recommending three changes. The first is to increase the amount of promotional increases from 5% up to 10%. This change brings the amount of promo a promotional increase in line with the new higher starting salary policy, which is also up to 10%. The second recommendation we are making is a new section, section 5.5.5, which allows the CEO to award, sorry, I'm at home and the dog's barking, I'm awfully sorry, allows the CEO to award um, an increase to retain a key professional or managerial employee in a position deemed critical to business needs or difficult to fill. We have experienced other employees seeking out our talented staff. And in some cases, because that position is so critical to business needs, we need a tool to counter offer to retain that key employee. Our current policy doesn't allow for this. Lastly, uh, we're recommending section 5.5.6, which allows the CEO to award a non-merit non pay increase to address compression or equity issues. These issues have from time to time happened, but under our current policy, we have no way to address them. Under the header of housekeeping items, um, you'll find changes to correct titles that have changed over the last 20 years. Um, we've also included some additional language to provide clarity and eliminate some of the misinterpretations we've had. And then additionally, we have moved into this section um, policy that already exists, but it just fits better in um, the, the pay plan and compensation section. If these recommendations are adopted, no additional budget funds are requested. Um, in the 2021 budget, uh, funds are included to cover any increases to staff wages. And at this time, we have no compensation changes planned. Um, with that, I'd love to entertain any of your questions that you may have with regards to these policy changes. problems that we are facing, is that going to increase, are we going to have a problem in the 2022 budget that, that you're going to be bringing four things in that budget for the compression problem? We have no planned changes at this time, um, but we have had compression issues in the past. And as the policy is written now, we don't have any ways to address those issues. So um, while we don't have any plans to bring anything forward as far as um, changes for 2022, we need more tools in our compensation toolkit. And so that's what we're looking to do by adding these changes to the policy. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Anybody at all? 
Is there a track uh -huh. changes version of this document that's in our packet? No, there is not. There's only a list of the changes that was provided that has the section number and the change that was um, that's being made or an overview of the change. Uh, going forward, it'd just be much easier to be able to track or see those changes in a track change document. Uh, it's just kind of hard to go back and forth um, in this circumstance. Uh, thank you. Sure. Thank you for your feedback. Anybody else have any questions? Seeing none, this is an action item. I would recommend or we can entertain a motion. Chair, I move that the board of directors adopt section five of the personnel policy manual as amended. Second. I move by Mr. Roberts, seconded by uh, uh, Mr. Merrill. Mr. Murray. Yeah. Mr. Murray is on my left here. In case you can't see that. This is my right. That's my left. Um, any discussion on the on motion? Seeing none. Favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I see now. Say thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, chair's report. Uh, made it through the heat wave. I hope everybody else did. Uh, obviously, we were, it was a very high humid time. Um, I don't know how everybody else, except for like Marysville and Arlington, who are already uh, banned fireworks. Uh, Lake Stevens, everybody's up in arms about fireworks this year. So we don't have a ban on that, so they want to have an emergency ban, which is uh, kind of under consideration, but we think it's illegal to do that. So some people have done it, some people haven't. We don't want to try, we don't want to chance it, so we're going to let it go. That's kind of what's going on around uh, Lake Stevens. We do have uh, really nice uh, farmers market that started last month or month before. Uh, that's doing really really well. Uh, a lot of uh, other municipalities have farmers markets. We hadn't had one for a long time and I tell you it is, it is a breath of fresh air to have a farmers market down in our brand new North Cove Park at the mill and uh, it's just a lot of fun to go to. Uh, uh, we are not doing an office fest this year. Uh, we couldn't get it planned in time. So we really didn't know what was going on with COVID so we did uh, cancel office fest for the second year in a row uh, and I'm looking forward to planning on it for next year. And other than that, there's not a whole lot else going on for me. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to July 7th for groundbreaking here at Mill Creek. I hope most of you can come join us for that. Uh, it's going to be uh, an interesting time. And like like uh, the CEO said, it's like the phoenix is rising back out of the ashes. And, uh, we can get busy on, on what we need to be doing. Uh, with that, I would go around the room for other people to have a report. Let's start in the room with uh, Councilmember Schwede. Uh, well, it was a warm weekend. Um, we had a ban down at Legion Park, and I decided that was my first outing. And there were hardly any people there, but it was uh, beer and wine, so it was uh, gated and you had to be over 21. But it was so hot. I mean, I couldn't stay for the whole thing. Sweat was l literally running in my eyes and down my face. Um, but that's all gone, and we've got multiple activities happening this weekend, uh, both at Legion Park downtown, which will have a bunch of things for little kids and face painting if anyone's interested. And then we've got our big thing down at Howler Park, which is right on the water. So if anyone wants to head down to Arlington, we've got all kinds of activities. No parade this year, by the way. Well, who would have thought that June would have been too hot for events? <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. And also my experience has been you can ban fireworks, but it takes a couple of years for the word to get out. Because right. uh, they'll spend all their time running around reminding people of new laws, new ordinance. Yeah. Um, other than that, yeah, very glad to be back in the room, meeting in person. Uh, next meeting, maybe we won't have to wear these silly masks. That would be great. <laughs> 
Uh, seems that we're six feet apart, and probably everybody here has been vaccinated. Um, and uh, yeah, we survived the, the heat. Uh, we also had this last weekend, we had a band playing down, and usually up right on the water, and right by the, the lighthouse, you get a nice breeze off the water. That was not happening, <laughs> but we had a, a, some tents set up, and it was, it was manageable. Uh, yeah, it was good, and there was beer, and it was a good time. So, glad to be out of, out of those woods on these better things. And Mr. Art? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I have a question before my other question. Are we going into executive session? Uh, no, there's no executive session today. Another question that would only pertain to being asked in executive session. So, I don't know what to do. I'm going to get scolded for asking a question that should be in executive session. Follow me? Yeah, I follow you. I don't know. Al, what do you think? I don't understand the question. I could hear the question. Uh, Mr. Arden thinks the question that we should only be asked in executive session. We're not having an executive session, so how does he ask his question? What, what, what's, what's the subject matter? What is the subject matter? If I go there, I mean, okay, it's uh, regarding the purchase of the property that I had uh, questioned on the process that was involved. I haven't heard another word about it. You can't have an executive session on I, I could actually report uh, public information, uh, Board Member Norton, is, which is that the purchase and sale agreement uh, has been finalized. I have signed it. Uh, it is pending signature by the seller. Um, and uh, we have Roland online if we have any substantive questions. I recall that uh, some of the questions we got from the board during the initial review of this had to do with whether the organization would have time to review the environmental conditions of the property and and we do have that in the contract and we're satisfied and so I don't know if there are any other questions that, that would require further discussion uh, offline but uh, that's the status okay well I, th I think that's kind of clear thank you anything else Mr. Uh, yeah, a couple of small things. You know, I was looking at the uh, uh, expenditure approval, with, you know, of course I didn't see my name, but, <laughs> but um, there's one next to certain um, employees that says um, claim for expense tuition. Somebody explain, I mean, we got people here going to college? Uh, training, uh, I believe uh, Cesar's a panelist at this point, or is he? I, I am. Uh, I am, uh, Rick. What was the question? This is Cesar. Uh, the question, I'm going to paraphrase board member, and if I don't get it right, please correct me. But I, board member is uh, inquiring about what types of tuition uh, benefits the organization covers for employees. Oh, OK. Uh, that is a uh, training question under um, under Jerry. Uh, Jerry, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me, Cesar? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Hi, this is Jerry. Um, so we do have a tuition reimbursement program uh, available for all employees. We require approval in advance and we monitor grades and accomplishments. The, <clears throat> the program is designed for uh, primarily for um, learning opportunities that will benefit the employee in their career. So we do have employees that advance through, you know, professional training, and this is one of those tools and benefits that we offer. Does that help? Not quite. Professional training as in exactly what? I mean, that's, that's a pretty broad answer there, professional training. At a school? Here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can give you an example. We have actually someone working through a master's program um, will be able to apply that the the new tools that they gain in that program to their work, and it may actually also provide for them to get promoted within our agency to other work, other positions. So an employee could, in essence, 
be pursuing um, an advanced degree other than the one they have at a university or college. And they could get reimbursed for their tuition from this employer. That correct? That's that's correct. What I what I don't know, and I'll have to get back to you on, is is I think there's a cap, for example, on how much reimbursement uh, for how many quarters. So I would have to get back to you to provide you more information on that, and I'm happy to do that. Okay, I appreciate that. You know, I, I'm interested because you see, community transit. I'm in a unique unique position that <clears throat> they take taxes out of my out of my pay, and in order to do that. I'm, in order to do that, you know, they have to take the taxes out of, of the money that I get. And so therefore, I'm an employee here. But I'm really not an employee here. But if they want to insist that I'm an employee here, I may go on and ask if I could get my master's degree. All right, never mind. <laughs> you know, I expected a few chuckles. All right, I'm sorry. Yeah. I've had it. You and I have talked about that. <laughs> it's great. Okay, I thank you. All right, anything else, Lance? No, nothing else, thank you. Uh, let's go on to uh, Tom Merrill. Um, yeah, a couple of things. Um, uh, like uh, Chair Daughtry, there's been interest in doing uh, removing fireworks from uh, the city, and that's going to be a no-go here as well. Um, I do encourage people to come to the uh, Snohomish Farmers Market now. It is open. It's very nicely done, and it is located at our new and refurbished Carnegie building that is also open for business if you want to uh, engage that for a wedding or some other function. And then finally, I would say, uh, we had the Snohomish Garden Club this last weekend, and I bring that up because uh, I don't recommend anyone hosting one in 100 105 degree weather. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Mayor Herring. Thank you, Chair Daughtry. Um, I do want to thank Rick and uh, the, the rest uh, of his team that came here to visit our city. We enjoyed it greatly. It was a, a good opportunity to show uh, them around uh, with some things happening. So thank you. Thanks to staff for putting together this hybrid format. And in Marysville, yes, we while we have banned fireworks, we have a robust uh, city-run fireworks show and food trucks and all that. So uh, a really good option for folks. Thanks, and everybody have a safe and happy fourth. Thank you, Mayor Aaron. Uh, Councilmember Roberts. Well, I think this fireworks uh, business is uh, kind of circling around most of the towns that haven't banned it. <clears throat> I will say that uh, it, that whole process is not for the faint in heart. I, I was part of that in Linwood, and uh, that'll keep you up at night. Um, anyway, um, I also just wanted to say that a lot of good things are going on in Stanwood. A lot of uh, we just cut a ribbon on the Port Susan Trail that's going to eventually be about a four mile trail, and uh, just a lot of good things happen here. A lot of growth, and um, just uh, really becoming. Uh, a different city. You know, when I first met my wife 40 years ago, uh, I asked her about her hometown of Stanwood. There was 2,000 people. And now I think we're about 8,000. So a lot of good things going on. And then one one last thing, I would I enjoyed this hybrid meeting. I will say that if we can get the masks off, I think we'd be able to hear the audio a little bit better. And so that's just one one little comment. And other than that, that's, uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Mayor Smith. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, as you as you all know, I'm on the uh, Sound Transit board as well, and uh, and uh, I've always appreciated the uh, congenial partnership with Sound Transit and Community Transit. Um, <clears throat> the Sound Transit board's been working on the uh, program realignment process under the um, expert leadership of our chair Kent Keel. And we're getting closer to getting the resolution done that will help guide the process uh, for the program realignments. Uh, but I'm happy to uh, say as of today, um, it, oh, well, and so the program's got aligned into four different tiers. 
Uh, and the first tier is less than a two year delay, whether it's based on cost and, um, and all that. So uh, we have been fighting your Sound Transit Snohomish County team, which is Dave Summers and Paul Roberts and myself to get the Linwood to the Southwest Everett station um, in the first tier. Uh, so we're uh, very hopeful that that will stay in the first tier and um, we'll, just we'll just have to phase in the last jog up to Everett. Um, and Paul Roberts, if you know Paul Roberts, he's Mr. Climate and uh, he has also gotten into the resolution uh, that, gosh, I lost that, uh, that uh, as a new, one of the four, the, uh, uh, four uh, things that we're approving, um, is a mandate to focus on climate uh, change and do everything we can uh, with the Sound Transit organization to um, be as climate friendly as we possibly can. So uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm hoping that uh, that this all goes well. Uh, we're supposed to vote on this resolution at our next July meeting, uh, but We'll see. Anyway, thanks. Councilmember Wright. I will just happily say fireworks are banned down in Southwest County this year. So um, happy fourth to everybody. And I understand the struggle um, that everybody's facing. So, but anyway, happy and safe fourth to everybody. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Gallagher. Pretty quiet down here on uh, South County as well in Briar, and uh, it's a great format for the meeting. Everybody have a happy fourth. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, there's Matsumoto right as well as well. Oh, is she? Is she there? Oh, there she is. Mayor Matsumoto right. Welcome. I didn't see you there, sorry, go ahead. Well, I had my video off for most of this. Um, well, fireworks are also not gonna happen in this city, I hope. It's illegal, that's all I have. Uh, a lot of, uh, I just wanna just comment uh, on a lot of the wonderful things that are um, happening and going to happen uh, with some of the connections, uh, future connections with CT and in Mount Lake Terrace too. I have a lot of ideas. I hope to talk to somebody about it soon but um, really need to get this thing going so that it's gonna be ready on um, uh, 2024. Thank you. Thank you. And there is no executive session today. Is there any other business you brought forward? Seeing none, we are adjourned.